Okay, um, you'll notice that I have philosophy of science up here today rather than philosophy of science and something else. I told you my original schedule was that I was going to deal with philosophy of religion and philosophy of science last week. Well, when I got into philosophy of religion, I realized that was at least a class. In fact, I went 10 minutes over. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking now about what I'm going to do, what we're going to do if we have a philosophical theology too. Mm -hmm. um, what I may do is take some eyes, some particular, what I think are most important for our concerns as theology students, and focus on some of those. Um, but while philosophy of religion is the most, most pointedly relevant to us in terms of our knowledge of God, the philosophy of science is critically important to us, whether you realize it yet or not, because that is the dominant worldview that exists in Western culture today. The idea that science is the way to find knowledge is the most influential um, paradigm that exists in the Western world today. And I want to talk about that in a few minutes, but as I, again, as I worked through this, I decided, last week I decided I needed the whole two hours on philosophy of religion. This week I decided we needed the whole two hours on philosophy of science. Um, next week, <laughs> unless I get another revelation, Next week we will deal with ethics, philosophy of ethics in the first hour, which is what is right? How do we know right from wrong? The second hour we will deal with philosophy of aesthetics, which is what is beauty? And how do we determine what is beauty and what isn't? Which is a really screwed up part of our society. Um, as if ethics isn't. And then I'm pushing, rather than sort of a conclusion time, uh, the other two things we I said we would talk about is philosophy of human nature and philosophy of politics. Well, politics is going to have to wait. Not that it's not interesting, but of all the things I felt that we could postpone or set aside for now, uh, philosophy of politics was one of them. And when we say politics, we don't mean political parties and Republicans versus Democrats and all of that. What we mean is the philosophy of how human society is organized and how it works. That's what politics really means, is the organization of human society and the management of that organization. So, some people will get to that, but uh, probably not this term, okay? My apologies for that, but uh, it's always a matter of trying to decide what are the highest priorities. And then, of course, on the third, we will have the final exam. I, I hopefully, midday Monday, I will have those available. And do let me know at the break or at the end of class if you need me to email them to you. Otherwise, they will be available on the website. Okay. As always, philosophy, literally love of wisdom, from the Greek phileo for love, and sophos, which means wisdom. The definition we probably want to go with, there's three definitions here. Is the bottom one. Philosophy is the attempt to think rationally and critically about life's most important questions in order to obtain knowledge and wisdom about them. Okay, that's what we're about. Today we want to talk about philosophy of science, and we want to begin with the nature and the limitations or limits of, of philosophy of science. Now, philosophy of science is so dominant. Um, at one point, I thought I was going to get a PhD. Well, there were no PhDs in theology anywhere in the Northwest at that time. We were living in Seattle, so I applied to a number of schools that had PhDs in philosophy, since philosophical and systematic theology is my focus. Well, when I applied to the Department of Philosophy at the University of Washington, right there in Seattle, I spoke with a woman in their office, and she said, well, what area are, of philosophy is, is your interest? And I said, well, primarily epistemology, but obviously some metaphysics. And she said, I'll never forget that, she said, oh, we don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm going, really? You have no interest in the nature of reality or how you can know what's real or true. Oh, no, no, we only focus now on the philosophy of science which again is indicative of the fact that science has become the dominant paradigm in our culture, so the philosophy of science, and you know, the University of Washington is a major university, the philosophy department of a major university only is concerned about philosophy of science. Not ethics, not aesthetics, not epistemology or metaphysics or anything else, not philosophy of religion, only philosophy of science. Now, the first question that we ask, um, well, let, let's do this. As I said today, most people, at least in the West, know that science brings us knowledge. And many of those people, whether they are conscious of it or not, they have the assumption that the kind of knowledge that comes from science is inherently more trustworthy. Trust me, I'm a doctor. <laughs> yes. I mean, would, would it make sense to say, trust me, I'm a plumber? <laughs> and yet we have these sort of truisms. 
what, what I love, and you guys may remember the commercial where this actor gets up and he's got a white coat and, and he's, he's, it's a, sell, a commercial, he's selling something. And he says, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. And then he goes on to tell us why we should trust him. <laughs> right? You, do you remember that? Yeah, it was a real ad. It's because he slept at Holiday Inn or something. Yeah, yeah whatever. Well, I don't remember what it was. Um, they quote in the book, they mention that the very fact that they say, well, this isn't rocket science. <laughs> or this isn't brain surgery, is another expression. The idea being that those levels of scientific expertise imply a higher order of understanding. Carolyn's old, old business, the people at her work used to say, well, it's not rocket surgery. <laughs> but again, all of those sort of reflect the fact that science is held as a higher order or a more important or a much more, more trustworthy kind of knowledge than knowledge that can be found in any other way. In fact, as I've said, science in the Western world has become the dominant paradigm and worldview through which people view their understanding of ultimate truth and meaning and everything else. If you can't prove it scientifically, maybe there's something wrong with it. Um, Sir John Polkinghorne, I was just talking to Chris about him yesterday. Um, I'll give you this quote, then I'll talk about Polkinghorne. Uh, John Polkinghorne said, science and religion have one extremely important thing in common. They are both, they are both concerned with the search for the truth just different aspects of the truth. Now the Western world would say that science is for sure, unquestionably, a search for truth. But those other things, philosophy, religion, you know, mostly that's just mythology, that's superstition, that's something less. Which is a very new idea, by the way, just in the last couple hundred years. Um, now, Polkinghorne was a physicist. In fact, one of the foremost physicists in quantum mechanics. He studied under the man who more or less could be considered the, you know, the, the inventor or the discoverer of quantum mechanics, who was a full, uh, physicist named Dirac in uh, Cambridge, Oxford and Cambridge. Those people jump back and forth so much. Um, and when he got, I think in his 50s, Polkinghorne announced that as a person of faith, he felt he had contributed all of the best he could contribute to science, and so therefore he was going to become a, a, an Anglican priest. And he pursued Anglican orders, became a priest, served in parish ministry, became the president of Queen's College for a, a number of years. And so today is considered, and he's an extraordinary thinker and writer. Again, he was one of the foremost physicists in the world. His mentor, and the man he worked with and under, Dirac, was, um, as I say, one of the inventors of quantum mechanics, um, was, was a co-winner co of the Nobel Prize in Physics with Schrodinger in 1933. You know the name Schrodinger? You ever heard of Schrodinger's cat? Well, the number, Heisenberg was a close friend, a friend of Dirac's, you know, and, and all this. So Polkinghorne is at the very highest level of scientific achievement. And he also loves Jesus and, his, and serves as a minister. And so he's a really strong voice in the, the understanding of the relationship and the integration between science and faith. Um, there's a wonderful essay. I, I recommend a book to you, a book called um, Life, God, and Other Small Things. Oh. Um, Eric Metaxas, you all know the name Eric Metaxas? I've mentioned him in here, I think. Eric Metaxas is an author. He wrote, he wrote the book Amazing Grace that was the basis of the movie Amazing Grace about the life of William Wilberforce. Yes. He's written a lot of biographies. He wrote a biography most recently of Dietrich Bonhoeffer mm -hmm. uh, that's very popular, a bestseller. He wrote another book called Seven Men, Their Faith and What Made Them Great, which is about Bonhoeffer, uh, <laughs> Bonhoeffer uh, Wilberforce, and, you know, and five others. Um, and so he's a, a considerable author in his own right, but he, Metaxas is the host, the creator and host of a thing called Socrates in the City in New York City, where they bring major thinkers, not only Christian, but predominantly Christian, as he, Metaxas is a Christian, they bring in these speakers with expertise in various areas, and they will give a 30 to 40 minute talk, and then they'll have question and answer. Well, this book, Life, God, and Other Small Things, I think that's the name of it, I can confirm that at the break, um, is the transcript both of Metaxas's introductions to them, which are hilarious. Eric Metaxas is one of the funniest human beings I've ever met. He is really funny. Um, I've been reading some of the stuff to Carolyn, and we've just been roaring over it. 
But then these very serious people come on, on and talk, and then they have a question and answer. Um, and this has probably got eight, I think it's eight or nine different uh, talks in it. The first one is Sir John Bulkinghorn, because he was knighted for his, his efforts. But um, technically, the more appropriate name, they don't, Sir John Bulkinghorn should not be able to call him. We should call him now the Reverend Doctor John Bulkinghorn, because that a theological title is supposed to supersede even a knighthood. Anyway, I recommend that book to you because that one thing is the first essay that will introduce you to John Bulkinghorn and his kind of direction of understanding. There are a lot of things in that book that deal with science and faith. The second talk is by Peter Kreeft, a philosopher uh, from Boston, and he is retired now, I think, um, dealing with the meaning of suffering. And beautifully done. Kreeft is also a great community. So, I recommend those books to you. Uh, anything else by Metaxas, or if you want to, you can go online to SocratesInTheCity.com, and they have, um, you can get, watch videos of the interviews that have been done and the talks people have done. Okay, anyway, anyway. So, the relationship between science and faith is a major issue there. But there are some real issues we have to start with in terms of boundary issues about the philosophy of science. Like, what is science? What are the limits of science? And how is it that science can play well with others, or not? Because a lot of people think it doesn't, that science can't and shouldn't interact with, say, theology or theological beliefs. So first, let's talk about how science is to be defined. This isn't as easy as you might think. Um, frequently, science is defined as something like this. Systematic inquiry into the natural world, which aims to organize, predict, and explain empirical data. That's a dictionary definition. But we run into problems even with that. What does it mean to predict? Because we get into the question of causality. You remember when we talked about David Hume saying cause and effect was not reliable? Well, predicting in science is, is an expression of causality. You know, the predictability of what's going to happen in the future. When you say empirical, what does that mean? Is empirical what we experience just by our direct sense? Typically, empirical means what can we experience by our senses? But um, science, for instance, uses other kinds of analytical tools, meters and measurements and, you know, um, personal testimony of experience and everything else. And because of that, because it's not all firsthand, how is scientific empirical data any different than the kind of things that history of journalism use, which are not usually identified as science, but rather are sociological uh, disciplines? You, we can differentiate, for instance, between the hard sciences, as they're sometimes called, which are physics, chemistry, biology, the stuff that deals with quanta of data, versus soft sciences, like psychology, sociology, anthropology, where it's a much more general observation and then drawing of almost personal conclusions as to what those things mean. You see the difference? Yes. So even understanding what science is and the limits of science get us into philosophical complications. You will remember from our first lecture that one of the things that philosophy does as one of its primary objectives is it defines terms. It sort of lays the groundwork, clarifies everything, so that you can, can then move forward on talking about what does this mean? What is true about this? What is real? What is real? What is true? How can we know? But before you can answer any of those kind of questions in any way at all, you have to make sure you've defined your terms. Well, Science is a very hard thing to even define. Um, attempts to define science based on, and you probably heard this if you were in school, the repeatability of experiments. All right, it's a, the scientific method involves being able to, to demonstrate the repeatability of an ex, uh, the results of an experiment. Or the testability of hypotheses. You have a hypothesis, you test it, and you can, you know, if you can repeat that, then it's science. Well, what do you deal with scientific fields that deal with past events? like archaeology, paleontology, astrophysical cosmology. You can't repeat the birth of a black star to see if what you understand about it from, you know, uh, from astrophysical cosmology is accurate. You, know, you can't, if you're talking about uh, archaeology, reconstruct a 4th century BC Nordic village to figure out you know, what kind of utensils they ate with. You do the best you can with what you got, but you can't repeat it. You can't perform experiments on it. You can only propose hypotheses and then see if further digging 
demonstrates that to be at least accurate. All right? So even trying to define science is not easy because it's hard to come up with what are the necessary properties that are inherent in what we call science. Is that clear? Which is exactly why philosophy of science is both hard and it's important. Because remember, philosophy defines terms. <coughs> philosophy clarifies the basic understanding of things in order to then move on to a higher level of perception about what is meaningful, what is real, what is true about those things. Okay. As always, you'll stop me if I'm not being clear if you have questions about this stuff. Now, a basic modern idea about science is if you can't see it, feel it, or hear something, it doesn't exist. In the book, they quote uh, the kangaroo in Dr. Zeus's Horton Hears a Who saying exactly this. Well, that is the view that many people have about life. They don't believe in ghosts because you can't see them or hear them or feel them. They don't believe in spirit. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in angels because you can't see them, hear them, feel them. Now, that view that something must be empirically verified, empirically verified to be known is called scientism. Scientism is the belief that what is scientifically demonstrable is the only thing that is real. So faith can't be real. God can't be real. Angels can't be real. The human soul can't be real. Love, honor, loyalty are really real. They're just chemical, biochemical things that happen in us under certain other stimuli that cause us to be that way. Now, there have been various attempts in the last 200 years or so to try to almost enforce this kind of scientism approach. Now, recognize the difference between science and scientism. Scientism is this radical, exclusivistic approach to science as being the only source of truth, the only way to knowledge. It's the same thing as the difference between Islam and Islamism. Islam is a religion practiced peaceably by 1.7 billion people or something. Islamism is the radical, angry, you know, militant, aggressive version of that, which is a very small percentage of those people. So the ism is the important part of that. It's not that I'm saying that there's a problem with science, but there is a problem with scientism. We talked earlier, when we were talking about um, the, the nature of truth, about the logical positivists. It was a group called the Vienna Circle, developed logical positivism in the late 1800s, early 1900s, literally 1882 to 1936. They started and then they disbanded. Um, and they actually proposed that for anything to be considered truth, it must be empirically verifiable. They came up with what was called the verification principle, that something had to be empirically demonstrated to be true or real. Well, the problem with that, as you may recall our conversations, is that the very, the very idea of a verification principle cannot be empirically Justify. You can't scientifically, empirically prove the verification principle that that's a valid thing to try to enforce. So it is self-defeating. In the same way, scientism, which is bigger than you know, the logical positivists were one sort of manifestation of that, but it's much bigger than that. Scientism is self-defeating because its demand that all knowledge be empirically verified cannot itself be empirically verified. You cannot do an experiment to prove that. Something can't be true if it's not empirically verified. So it is self-defeating. There is an inherent defeater, as you talk about in philosophy. Make sense? And yet, this is so much the dominant principle of philosophy that the modern world works under. The likelihood is that 82% of the people you know think this way, whether they're even conscious of it or not. That if it's scientifically demonstrated, it's true. If you got it from church, not so much, right? And that's, that's like saying, well, it must be true, I read it on the internet. It just doesn't make any sense when you think about it. What? Now, in addition to that not being empirically verified, we have to recognize that science itself, that is all aspects of science, are dependent upon and rest on numerous assumptions that themselves cannot be empirically verified. Again, we're getting into the philosophy of science here now because we're talking about the limits of science. 
Some of those non-empirical foundations on which science is built are the laws of thought that we were talking about earlier. The law of identity, the law of non-contradiction, the law of the excluded middle are the laws of thought. They are the foundational principles on which all reason and rationality are built, and yet they are not empirically verifiable. You can give examples in which they are true, but you can't prove them to be true by experiment. And yet without them, logical thought is considered to be not possible. By everybody. I mean, I don't care how radical a scientism advocate you are. You still have to maintain the laws of thought, or you don't move forward from here. The, um, oh, sorry. The general reliability of sense perception. Since science has to do with doing experiments and seeing what happens, there is inherent in that the idea that when you see what happens, there is some reliability associated with that. That you can rely on what you experience when you view, or hear, or feel, or smell the results of an experiment, right? Well, that's an assumption of something that is not empirically verifiable. The reliability of our sensual perceptions, which is basic to all scientific pursuits, can't be proven empirically. The law of causality. This idea, think about it. Somebody does an experiment. An example they use in the book, for instance, is when they were trying to identify the virus that caused the HIV, or the, the uh, that caused AIDS, the HIV virus that caused AIDS. Um, the, the assumption that they worked on, that they worked on with Ebola or tuberculosis or any other disease as an example, is that there is a virus that causes this disease. And so we seek to find that virus. Well, the idea of causality is, if you found a virus, and that virus one time causes HIV, and one time causes tuberculosis, and one time causes malaria, and another time it causes Ebola, where would the scientific process be? The idea that there is a reliable causality, that certain things, causes, result in certain effects, is fundamental. Without causality, if you did a scientific experiment and you said, this was all the parameters of the experiment and this was the result, unless you believe that if you did all exactly the same thing again, that this would be the result, then why do you do the experiments? Make sense? Third, the uniformity of nature, that the laws of nature themselves are constant and reliable. Gravity does not change. The laws of thermodynamics do not change. The strong and weak nuclear forces that hold atoms together do not change. If they did, Katie bar the door. Not only would science not be possible, but life wouldn't exist. The, and, and then the principle of values, which certainly is not empirically, um, empirically provable. Um, that supports scientific reporting. What if 80% of all scientists were proven to be liars in their results? What would happen to science? It would stop. What if, you know, why is it, and if you paid any attention, when they find a scientist who, who falsifies results, boy, that's like dropping a nuclear bomb. The world ends for that person. Because if we do not have a sense that honesty in pursuit of scientific results, which is a value, not empirically verifiable, unless we have those values, science can't happen. Also, unless we have some sense that science is pursued in fundamentally moral ways. If a significant number of science, scientists pursued immoral objectives, if, for instance, we had a large number of scientists that said, you know, we've decided that, you know, because it will result in greater knowledge and a higher good, that kidnapping children off the street and vivisecting them, meaning dissecting them alive, will, you know, will achieve what we want to achieve. Don't we have a pretty strong sense that we're not going to go there? That's immoral? I mean, that's why we get into issues like, you know, uh, stem cell research. Because the issue of this is, in effect, living tissue that they're experimenting on. Or, you know, what else? What, there are values that science maintains, and yet they may argue about some of the gray areas along the edges, like stem cell research, but there's a, there's a huge body of value-oriented focus that they don't argue about, and that is a basic premise behind it, like honesty. All right? So, science rests on numerous non-empirically verifiable assumptions, and so scientism inherently doesn't work. Right? Now, let's get into some of the details of this. Let's talk further about uh, the nature and limits of science. When we talk about the relationship between science and truth, 
Polkinghorne said, so, you know, theology and, and science both, uh, they're similar in that they both seek truth, just different kinds of truth. Not every scientist would agree with that statement. Because there are two fundamental perspectives with regard to the relationship between science and truth. Um, if science is about seeking truth, then we deal with what's called scientific real, uh, realism. That's the view that scientific theories properly aim to give a true account of the physical world. So truth is important. In other words, science is trying to figure out what is true. Remember we talked about truth before and what the definitions of truth uh, might be. Justified true belief, well, what does it mean for something to be true? Um, scientific realism says there is a true way to describe what happens in the natural world, and that's what science is all about. Now, obviously that makes it important, that makes the philosophy of science important, because philosophy is about seeking after truth. All right? What is true is one of the fundamental questions of philosophy. But not everybody agrees with, with that idea that science is about um, a proper or true account of the natural world. There are people, scientists, who follow what's called scientific non-realism, and they insist that science is not ultimately about truth, that it is not concerned with providing accurate descriptions of reality, that there are other objectives that science has. It doesn't really care what's true. It's, it, that's not what it's about. It's not what it's seeking. And I'll give you a hint. We're going to talk about this, but for instance, it's they talk about seeking scientific advances. There's a pragmatism about it. If science is, is, a, is achieving goals, is successful in providing new medicines, et cetera, et cetera, who cares whether it's true or not? The idea is, does it work? If it works, it's true. If it doesn't work, it's false. So it's not really about truth to those people. Those are called non-realists. They're not trying to find a correlation between what science says about the world and whether that's true. That's not their issue, okay? We'll get into more detail about that. But you need to understand, first, scientific realism and scientific non-realism are two fundamentally different ways of approaching the scientific task. Are we looking to express truth about the world, or is science about something different than that? John? Um, well, then, what, what, what are they doing? I mean, if sci scientific non-realism insist that science is not ultimately about truth, and they're not concerned about providing accurate descriptions, and then what, what is it? Well, you sit right there and wait about 20 more minutes, and I'll tell you. I mean, that's what we're getting into. We're going to talk about scientific realism and scientific non-realism, uh, and what's, you know, what the problem is. And I'll, when I talk about scientific non-realism, I'll get into... I mean, how can it be science if it's... If it, if it, if it <laughs> well, that view. there are a whole lot of people who disagree with what you just said. You know, that's the point. They, I'm not, I'm not well, saying, I'm just asking questions. No, no, no. But, but, but in saying that, the assumption by asking that question, you are asking it from a scientific realism point of view. And that, when you say, if it's not about the truth, then what is it about? And say it with that tone. And I'm, I'm not being critical. I'm just saying that, that that reflects the idea that scientific realism is the right approach. Not everyone agrees with that. And we need to understand where they're coming from, too. Not that we have to agree with it. But, and I, I'm going to give you reasons why I don't agree with it. And that a book. Okay, but let's get into that. I, your, your question is the right question, but you're just about 20 minutes too early. Okay, so we'll, we'll get into that. All right, so scientific realism, again, the view that scientific theories properly aim to give a true account of the physical world. Uh, the dominant or the largest part of scientific realism is called inductivism. Inductivism uh, defines or approaches science as a process. That process, inductivism, proposes that a scientist, this is, here's the process, and this is what they define science as being. The scientist begins to simply observe things and gather data, followed by generalizations about those observations that then lead to a hypothesis or a theory which attempts to explain the data, and that followed, is followed by experiments to test the theory, which the results of which produce more data, and that process continues Data, observations about the data, a theory, experimentation, more data, you know, alter the experiment, try it again, more data, until finally the theory is either proven true or false. That's what most of us think of as science, right? Is that fair? That's what a scientist does, we think. Now, the central claims, to sort of sum that up, of inductionism as a scientific realism are, one, observation precedes theory. You don't, you know, you, 
first you look at stuff, and then you say, well, what is this telling me? You don't say, here's what I think it ought to be. Now let me look. All right? You don't put the card in front of the horse. That's one of the premises of inductionism. Secondly, theories are uh, formulated strictly in terms of experimental data. You go where the data takes you. You go where the, the results of the experiment take you. You don't presume to know before you observe and then do experiments. Right? All that sounds true to what we think of as science. Correct? And science is, or it can be at least, a rational process. Anybody can be dumb enough to turn anything into a non-rational process. But rightly done, science is a rational process. Those are all the premises behind inductivism as the dominant part version of scientific realism. But despite its attractiveness and the fact that it sounds to us like what science is and ought to be, there are some problems with inductivism. And there are two primary problems. One, prima facie, and you'll hear that expression in, in if you don't know what it means, prima facie means on the surface of it, on the face of it. On the face of it, inductivism naively assumes the possibility of theory neutral observation, that I can be a completely neutral observer of what's going on. Studies have shown that people tend to observe and interpret data in light of preconceptions, no matter how fair-minded they're trying to be. That's been demonstrated over and over and over again, so much so that there are a number of different versions of what's, what are called uncertainty principles. In physics, there's a version of the uncertainty that, that is sort of Newtonian physics. There's a version of the uncertainty principle that says that just trying to measure something changes it. So the process of observing itself changes what you're trying to observe. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that the process of simply observing something changes it. Now Heisenberg, he was a colleague of Dirac, who was you know, the, the mentor of Polkinghorne that I just quoted a few minutes ago. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that with regard to quantum particles, this is quantum physics, you know, forks and all those little things. That you have two choices. You can either figure out, you can nail it down as to where it is, but if you do that, you can't tell what direction it's going in. Or you can figure out what direction it's going in, but if you do that, you're not going to know exactly where it is. You got a choice. You can either know where it is, but not where it's going, or you can know where it's going, but not know where it is, which means there is always in the process of observation an inherent uncertainty about the thing you're observing. And that if you try too hard to nail down where it is or where it's going, by that very process you may change where it is or where it's going. Mm -hmm. So just by trying to observe it too exactly, you can change the nature of the thing you're observing. Well, but it's futile. It's absolutely futile. Well, no, it's not futile. What it means is that we have to be aware, and this is true, I mean, Sociologists and anthropologists observe this as an absolute law. That the closer you try to get, for instance, to a primitive tribe in order to observe them, the more effect you're going to have on them, and therefore your very process of observation is going to change the thing you're trying to observe. So this, this applies to virtually every aspect of science, and yet, on the surface of it, inductivism does not take that into account. That's why it's a problem for them. Okay? Now, a second problem, now that's not to say you don't try to observe things. It's just you have to take into account that problem. This is the reason, by the way, that when you do experimentation, it's considered not only common, but necessary that you do things like double-blind tests. A double-blind test means even the scientist who's doing the test doesn't know which group is getting what. So that there can't be even the most inadvertent of outside influences on the purity of the, of the sample, right? Mm -hmm. That's all based upon that as an accepted scientific premise, that just observing something, if you're not, you know, no matter how good you're trying to be, you will have, to a greater or lesser extent, some effect on, the, on what you're observing. And inductivism on the surface does not acknowledge that. Doesn't mean it can't be applied as you, as you see through the experiments, but that's, a, that's the case. Secondly, it's unclear how much confirming experimental data is required to demonstrate that something is true. Since, inductive, since this is part of scientific realism, the idea is that you believe that 
there is some truth associated with what with your science. And therefore, you're trying to seek the truth. Inductivism doesn't answer the question of how far do you have to go in order to be able to say something is confirmed or that it's true. When is a scientist justified in moving from the claim that a theory is confirmed? And when you say a theory is confirmed, that means that we have test results that agree with what our theory was. It confirms them. But that's not absolute. That doesn't mean it's absolutely proven. And we're going to get into the, you know, the falsification idea in a minute. So how far, how much data do you have to get? How many experiments do you have to do in order to first say this appears to be confirmed because we haven't found anything to say it's not true and then later to go to the stronger level of saying it is true. The reason the theory of evolution is still the theory of evolution is while scientists claim to have found a lot of data that seems to confirm it, they haven't absolutely proven it so it's still a theory. They haven't proven it's true, they've only by, by the agreement of most of scientists, confirmed that it appears to be the best answer. All right? Now, probably the biggest problem with inductivism, however, is the fundamental problem that is called the problem of induction. Since this is called inductivism, it deals with induction. Induction, remember, this inductive reasoning, inductive, deductive. They always talk about, by the way, Sherlock Holmes, deduces the solution? He doesn't. He induces the solution. That's a wrong use of the word deduce. Because he doesn't, you know, deduction means you have an absolute verifiable proof of it. When Sherlock Holmes sees all of this, you know, he can tell from the dirt on your shoes and, you know, the cigarette smudge on your lip and all that, he can tell a lot of things about you and from the things he can tell about you, he then draws a conclusion. That's induction. Drawing a conclusion from apparent evidence Deduction is observing something that is, you know, proven, that is there in front of you. Anyway, just in case you're showing like all the spans. The principle of induction takes data from past observations, like experiments, you know, watching closely, observing. And from that, it predicts future events. Well, there's a problem with that, the problem of induction. And that is that while although science routinely reasons from observations, general observations, or particular observations, to universal conclusions and assumes the nature of what's going to happen in the future based upon that, David Hume, remember David Hume? David Hume argued philosophically and convincingly that you do not really have a rational way to say because we observed this in the past, it absolutely surely is going to happen in that way in the future. Hume this is, the deduct this is the inductive problem. Hume said, just because you saw this experiment done in this way with these parameters generate these results in the past, the only thing you really rationally can say about it is that's what happened in the past. You cannot guarantee, nor can you therefore rationally assure us, that if you replicate that experiment exactly, the results are going to be the same every time. And he used, you remember, the billiard ball analogy. That if a billiard ball, if you strike the billiard ball, and it rolls across the table, the cue ball, and it, it strikes another ball at a certain speed, on a certain place, with a certain spin. We assume that if you can replicate all of that, that the billiard ball is always going to go in exactly the same way. Well, Hume, logically, philosophically, is accurate when he says, you don't know that for a fact. That billiard ball could go straight up, or it could go straight sideways, or it could explode. Drawing conclusions about what will happen based upon what you observe that has happened, that there is a problem with that. Now, Hume, along with everybody else, says, yeah, but you got to move forward in life. You, know, that you have to make some assumptions. And that it is an act of faith. While you may not have any assurance that the same thing will ha happen given the same circumstances, the inductive process is critical to science. You can't have science... No experiment would ever be valid in any way unless you can believe that if you repeat it the same way, it's going to get the same results, and that allows you to predict what's going to happen. All experiments, all tests, all observations of anything that has happened would be useless and senseless unless we can at least, as an act of faith, if nothing else, expect that causality is going to be consistent. But, Again, on the face of it, this is an obstacle that inductivism is not prepared to overcome because the very idea of inductive reasoning is built into the name. 
much less the process. Does that make sense? Now, we talk about all these things as the philosophy of science. The doing of science involves getting on with it. Okay? And that's not necessarily the same thing we're talking about. We always need to understand that we're stepping back from getting our hands dirty with the experiment and talking about the meaning of this stuff. So don't confuse what common sense considerations of science or anything else we talk about here with the philosophical consideration of it. Fair? Okay. Now, so we're talking about the results of experiments. Another aspect of scientific re uh, realism gets into the issue of falsification. A philosopher named Karl Popper, a, a, scientific, a science and philosopher of science, uh, who lived 1902 to 1994. It's fascinating to me that the, like the three or four different people that are quoted in this chapter of the book, all of them died in the mid-90s. <laughs> You're wondering if maybe somebody had them dead. I don't know. <laughs> but Popper introduced the issue the, uh, that he calls falsification. And I will tell you, they quote him a number of times in the book, and he's very hard to understand. His quotes. So let me explain it to you. Falsification is the idea that science can or should be more in the business of proving what is false than in the business of trying to prove what is true. In order to delineate or make a difference between real science and pseudosciences, because pseudosciences can't be verified or falsified. All right, pseudosciences, belief in spirits, or whatever else it might be. Okay. Um, holistic medicine. It's, we just watched an episode of, of, um, of Perception, which is a TV show about a, a brain scientist who has himself is he's paranoid schizophrenic and he has these episodes so he's always struggling with is that real or is it not but the thing is that frequently his hallucinations give him insights that allow him to help because he, he consults with the fbi and helps him solve crimes it's a good show very like my characters <laughs> but he recently was talking to a guy who was who was in, involved in holistic healing and he goes into this rant about all this non-scientific garbage about holism and spirituality and you know ghosts and yeah you know, all this stuff well those are considered pseudosciences. Well, how do we differentiate between those things, other than going on a rant about them, and real science, real science? Popper proposed the criteria of falsification, which insists, and I'm quoting him here, statements or systems of statements in order to be ranked as scientific, as opposed to pseudoscientific, must be capable of conflicting with possible or conceivable observations. Any questions? <laughs> so let me explain. That means, you have to be able to prove that they're false before you can believe they're true. Prove right? that they could be false. Right. Prove that they could be false. Sorry. They have to be able to be proven false. All right? It doesn't mean you've proven them false. You have to be able to prove something is false to consider it scientific. If you can't prove it's false, like who can prove that there are ghosts that exist in the world? You can get personal testimony. You can see those glowing green lights on the Ghostbusters, you know, whatever. Not something people usually consider verification of falsehood or truth, right? Now, the reason why, sorry, go ahead. I just have a problem wrapping my head around the word conflicted, capable of conflicting. Well, capable of proving false. That's what that means. That's why I, I give you his quote, but what it means is you have to be able to prove that something might be, is, is false. Or it can't be science. If you can't be, proven false. What? you keep saying it is proven false, and it's that it's Well, you have to be able to prove right. it's false. There has to be the, the, the potential Fair. for it to be proven false. For what I'm to say. the example that they use in the book, I think, is like astrology. When you read your horoscope, you're, you're in this state of mind where you go, oh, yeah, that sounds just like me, but you can read 13 other right. people's horoscopes, and that sounds just like you, too. Yeah, you know, I also sound like a Sagittarius, and, uh, you know, like uh, Taurus or whatever. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me let me go a little bit more into that. The issue: Why false? Why not true? Why isn't he talking about the fact that you have to be able to prove it's true? Why is he focusing on the fact that it can't be scientific unless you have at least the potential of proving that it's false? Scientific theories are never really proven to be true, but some can be deemed superior because of their ability to resist refutation through vigorous testing. In other words, you can. Uh, let me tell you what that means, IOW. In other words, it only takes one false test result to prove that something is not true. Got that much? 
All you have to do is get one result that says something is, is false to be able to say, well, it's not true. Because if it's not true in every circumstance, under every test result, then it can't be really be true, true. But every positive test result that you get leaves open the possibility that some future test might still prove the theory is false. So it is easier to prove that something is false than that it's true. I do a test. I've got a theory, a hypothesis. And I do a test. And the test demonstrates that my hypothesis is false. That pretty much kills it. If it's false in any, in any legitimate experimental situation, it's false. But if I prove it's true, somebody could say, well, yeah, it was true based on that experiment. But you could do a different experiment, and maybe it would be false. So you never really completely prove a theory or hypothesis is true because there may be some other test in the future that could prove it false. But once you've proven it false once, then it's false. Right? Make sense? That's why it's the falsification theory, not the truthification theory. Because the ability to prove something is false, possibly, potentially, prove it's false, defines it as a science rather than a pseudoscience. Proving it true is a never-ending process. That's why we say that you know, something can be seen as superior. It's, if we've done 27 tests and each test seems to indicate that that is true, then we're getting some, some body of evidence that suggests it likely is true, but it's not absolutely proven. I do one test and it says it's false, then it's false. John? So do these who have embraced this, do they, do they approach the problem with the assumption that everything is true until it's proven false? Well, no. I mean, you have to choose one or the other. No, you don't. That's, in fact, as a scientist, that would be a bad, you're making a presumption. You're well, starting I, out deciding whether you no, think it's true or false, and science would say you can't do that. I didn't communicate my question correctly. If you're going to prove that it's false, you have to move forward with the assumption that what you're going to prove false must be true. It has to be, I mean, you're, you're proving that what... No, that it could others. be true. I'm sorry? That it could be true, not that it must be true. I have a hypothesis. I've looked at, I've observed all this data. And I say, well, it appears to me that Carolyn sleeps too much. <laughs> she doesn't. <laughs> and so I come up with an experiment you know, to try to say, does Carolyn sleep too much, or does Carolyn not sleep too much? I don't assume it's true, and I don't assume it's false. I try to come up with an experiment that would give me further evidence, more data, one way or the other. But I don't, you know, if I'm a good scientist, I don't start out saying, I am almost certain she sleeps too much. Now I'm going to try to prove it. Because then you really are falling into that category where you're starting with presumptions. And then just trying to prove your own previous, you know, your own a priori, your own your own previous beliefs. So a good scientist starts out with a neutral perspective. They will say, "Here's my hypothesis," and my job is to try to construct tests. And this is one of the most important and hardest part of science: tests that will demonstrate either that that hypothesis is true or false. But I don't necessarily start out with the assumption that I expect it's true. I present it as a hypothesis, which I believe is the best description of the data I have observed. But, but I still, again, a good scientist, and this is part of that, you know, that the idea that it's very hard to do, that, to not have some bias. You know, I've observed all this stuff, and most scientists, most human beings would say, and I'm so smart, I came up with something that explains it, and now I'm going to try to prove it. No, that's not science. Okay, science says this is the hypothesis. And in as neutral a way as I possibly can, I'm going to try to have evidence that it either is true or it's false equally. Now, the only thing this is saying is you can prove something is false. If the results, one result says false, it's false. You can't ultimately prove something is true because somebody could always say, well, yeah, you've only proven it's true to this point, but uh, there's one more experiment out there if you could figure it out that would, would, would not be true, and therefore the whole thing is wrong. Okay? So the falsification principle is a philosophical approach to determining whether the hypotheses or theories in science are true or false 
by demonstrating that falsehood is an easier, is, is a more reliable proof, but also as a way of saying, if you've got anything that people are proposing to be science, and it's not possible to disprove it, it's not possible to prove it false, then there you go, that's not science. It can't be science if there's no possibility of it being proven false. All right, nobody yet has come up with a test to prove that seances are not real. You know, you can, you can find the, you know, the projector behind the screen, you can see that they, you know, tied a rope from the table leg to their knee, you can do all that kind of stuff. That doesn't really prove anything. It doesn't prove it false. It just says that person was lying. But somebody else would say, well, you know, you've got a dishonest one. But there's really good, you know, mediums out there, too. You can't disprove it. You can't, you can't prove it false. And so, therefore, because you can't, there's no potential of that, then it can't be a science. But, okay, but there's certain, the law of thermodynamics, or whatever. I mean, so somebody who's adhering to this would say, well, it's most likely true because there's never been a test that's proven it false yet. Well, if you have a preponderance of evidence that some that have said true, 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 then you can say it appears that this has been confirmed, but we can't say it's absolutely true. That's the example of the theory of evolution. There is a lot of data that supports the theory of evolution by natural selection. There is. You don't have to like that, but it's a fact. I mean, that seems to be the best explanation for that. Therefore, scientists would say it appears to be confirmed, but it is still a theory because it is not absolutely true. But no one has come up with absolutely conclusive, you know, experimental data that says it has to be false. So therefore, it's still in play. It's still a theory. Okay. So that the theory of evolution is a good example where even though some scientists would say it's absolutely true, it's been proven, no, actually, it hasn't because you can never absolutely prove the truth of a scientific theory. You can only prove the falsehood of it. Right? So, let's keep going. Because of this, the logic of science is about, taking you back to logic now, remember you're all logicians, about modus tollens. Modus tollens is the logical argument that says, if P, then Q. Not P, Therefore, I'm sorry, not Q, therefore not P. This is the falsification principle. The not Q part says I found it to be false. And therefore, and it, it's saying if this premise is true, then this should be the result. I proved this isn't the result, therefore my premise must be wrong. Premise being the same as hypothesis. Now, I'll give you an example. They have one in there about, about Einstein uh, and you know, bending of light and all that kind of stuff, and Newtonian yes. physics. Here's my version. Um, if our electrical wiring for our living room was installed correctly, then the light will come on when I throw the switch. The lights do not come on while I, when I throw the switch. Therefore, our electrical wiring was not installed correctly. That is modus tollens. If P, if our wiring was installed correctly, then Q, the light will come on. Not Q, the light did not come on. Therefore, not P, our wiring was not installed correctly. All right, make sense? Now, the problem is, scientists sometimes fall into the logical fallacy of affirming the consequent, it's called. Logic is important. That's just the name of it, all right? Affirming the consequent could be the great blue horse, is what they call it. It's just this logical argument, which says, if P, then Q, same premise, Q, notice this is not falsification. This is a proposal that there is a true result. Q, therefore, P, this is a false argument. It's a logical fallacy. Let me give you an example. If Ross teaches well, Carolyn will do well on her philosophy test. <laughs> Carolyn did well on her philosophy test. Therefore, Ross taught well. You see that? If P, if Ross teaches well, then Q, Carolyn will do well on her philosophy test. Q, Carolyn did well on her philosophy test. Therefore, P, Ross taught well. See what's wrong with that? Pam? 
What if she skipped every class, never heard me lecture, but she busted her butt studying the book and passed the test because of that? There could be some, uh, the, the problem with reason the affirming the consequent is a fallacy is because there could be some other explanation for the middle argument, or for the middle premise, Q. She could never have heard me lecture on philosophical theology at all and still take the test and do well because she was a philosophy major. She studied the book really hard. Somebody gave them her notes. I could come up with a hundred different she ways cheated. in which she, 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 she and she chose she cheated. <laughs> so this is why it is harder to prove a positive, and in fact there's a logical fallacy in assuming you can sometimes, than it is to prove a negative. Pam. Back to your wiring story. Okay. There this would tie in with that. When you turn the switch on, good for you! <laughs> I was waiting for somebody to catch me on that. The light wouldn't go on, but that doesn't mean that CFE just didn't turn the power Absolutely on. Absolutely right. Yes. Yes. Okay. I, and I, and I, I did see that, and I was waiting. What if the power's off in the neighborhood? Yeah. yeah that was... Or, you know, what if the, the light, light switch is bad? Or the bulb is burned out. Or the bulb is burned out. Okay. Those are all legitimate things. Now, if I could present that in a way, if I said, if I said, if the power is on, our electrical wiring was installed correctly, and all the pieces are operational, okay. then the light will come on when we throw the switch. Okay. The lights did not come on when the switch was thrown, therefore the electrical wiring was not installed correctly. I could be more specific in my premises and make that a valid modus tollens argument. Okay, but I actually wrote that argument out, and then I looked at it, I went. Actually, there's a flaw in that, or a potential flaw. Yeah, you know, on the surface it's accurate, but there are other aspects of it, and it falls into the affirm. You know, not quite the affirming the consequent because it is a falsification uh, argument, but there the premises are not well stated. Is the reason it's false. Good for you, Pam. Thank you. <laughs> so you see, it, it, I mean, it's difficult to have that stuff up there, but the the not Q is provable in a way that the Q is not, because there can always be more other explanations. Okay, but I'm a little confused now. So, uh, with, the, with the light switch thing, but do they just simplify the premise? Or do they actually take into consideration all the other factors? Because okay, that then means a whole different thing on how it's put up there. No, it's the, the argument, I mean, if you step back, you say the premises have to be accurately and correctly stated. But do they state that? Well, or yeah, I mean, that's an assumption of logic. That, you know, the, that's an assumption of logic that most Tolans or any other, you know, reliable logical argument requires that the premises be stated accurately. And accurately means, you know, completely, among other things. That's not, that doesn't have anything to do with the falsification principle. That has to, you're asking a question about the nature of logical arguments. Logical arguments, the premises have to be accurate and they have to be complete to the point being made. If they're not accurate or they're not complete so that they, there are other things that could squeak in there, then the argument falls apart. But it's not the fault of logic. And that doesn't affect the, non, the falsification principle. Okay. You know, if the premises are accurate, modus tollens, which is a demonstration, a logical demonstration of the falsification principle, is viable. It's true. Okay. Okay? Is that fair? Yeah. I mean, you can always... It, like everything else, you can either do something well or you can do it poorly. You can take a correct logical argument and present it poorly, which means your premises are, are bad, poorly presented, um, and it doesn't fly. And Pam caught me on that. <laughs> right. And I realized I had realized it myself when I, after I wrote it down. But good for you. Let's take a break for a few minutes, and we're going to come back and switch to scientific non-realism. Um, well, let me just. Um, make a point that <laughs> I'm very pleased that you know Pam spoke up but a couple of other people apparently saw this is exactly what I hoped for in this class that you all begin to start thinking rather than just hearing something and saying oh, okay that you start thinking now oh, wait a minute because as we pursue these this way of thinking these kinds of understandings part of one of the goals is that we learn to think better and by better I mean more critically you know that we we're more aware of the accuracy or inaccuracy of 
premises of arguments and things like that. Because you hear this stuff all the time. I mean, I hear them every day. I, I think I mentioned, you know, I was, I was in, um, talking and somebody, and I made a point, and somebody said, well, if that's true, then why is it that so many churches do that? Well, that's a, a, that's a fallacy, a logical fallacy. It's the argument from majority. That because a lot of people do it, it must be right or true. We have to learn to hear those sorts of things. And you all are doing that. Okay? By catching the, 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 the faulty premise that I presented it. And I really was aware of it. Uh, I, after I wrote it, not when I was writing it, but afterwards I realized it. Okay, um, let's talk about the philosophy of science in terms of scientific non-realism help you understand where this is coming from. Scientific non-realism insists that science is not ultimately about truth or the seeking of truth, that it is not concerned with providing accurate descriptions of reality, that that's not the objective of science. Now again, remember, this is opposed to the realists who say that science does seek to provide a true account, and does provide a true account of natural phenomena. Non-realists don't say that that doesn't happen. They just say that's not the point. That's not what you're looking for. That's not why science exists. One version, the dominant version of non-realism is called instrumentalism. Instrumentalism proposes that the point of science, the reason we do and have science, is for its practical achievements, its problem-solving ability, rather than its ability to demonstrate truth. Who cares if it's true if they come up with a better mousetrap? What does truth have to do with that? What does truth have to do with those weird Dyson fans that don't have any blades and yet they blow air? I mean, truth is not an issue on that. It's a scientific discovery and invention that's really cool. What does is, what is truth and falsehood have to do with that? See my point? That's where the instrumentalist non-realists are coming from. They would say things like, science is an inquiry system for the solution of problems, not for the finding of truth. For the solution of problems. And the, the adequacy of individual theories is a function of how many significant empirical problems they solve, not whether or not they found something to be true. Now, this is a scientific version of the philosophical system called pragmatism which says, if it works, it's good. Or, if it works, it's true. If it doesn't work, it's false. That's the philosophy of pragmatism that William James and you know, uh, C.F. Pierce and others maintain. This is the scientific version of that philosophical principle of pragmatism, that whether it works, whether it achieves a desired objective is the point, not whether it's true or not. Right? Dan? What are empirical problems? An empirical problem is a science problem. A science problem would be, if I were Dyson, how can I create a fan that's really efficient and effective that doesn't have blades in it that could, could cut off people's fingers? Mm -hmm. Right? That's an empirical problem. Or, how can I design a mousetrap that catches more mice that you don't have to reload and not be able to take your own finger off? Or whatever else the problem is. How do I cure uh, Ebola? That's an empirical problem. It's a science problem. John? So according to instrumentalism, the, 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 the emphasis is on, on the process more than the result. Is that right? No, exactly the opposite. Instrumentalism doesn't care about the process. It only cares about the result. Um, it, it only cares about, did we come up with something that was helpful, beneficial, or cool? If we did, then okay. that was the point, okay? okay? So the end result really is the issue. Now, it's important to note that instrumentalists sidestep the problem with induction, the, the induction problem. Remember, the induction problem says that you can't guarantee that because you observed something in the past, it's going to happen again that way in the future. That's the induction problem, where you draw conclusions based upon some, you, you induce something based upon some experience. Well, the instrumentalists say, I don't care whether cause and effect works or not. All I know is you, got a, you invented a really cool fan. So it sidesteps the philosophical questions, because David Hume's arguments against 
against induction or against cause and effect is a philosophical argument. And the, the instrumentalists, our pragmatists, the point of the, they, say, they say, I don't care what you say philosophically. If it comes up with cool stuff, if it, if it cures a disease, if it you know, finds a better way for me to mow my lawn, I don't care what philosophy says. I don't care what's true or false. So it sidesteps that. One of the things we have to realize, though, is that realism also produces practical results. It's not like this is the only approach that produces practical results. It just, you know, lifts them up as being the only objective. Realism also, you know, a scientific realism also produces practical results. Um, but it says that it's not necessary to deny all affirmations or all seeking after scientific truth in order to get cool results. Right? So it's not, don't make the mistake of thinking that instrumentalism is the only one that's concerned with practical results. Scientific realism, the opposite of this, is also concerned about practical results, but it says you don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You don't have to say that truth isn't the objective in order to achieve beneficial, pragmatically useful scientific results. Truth and practical results can go hand in hand. Now, instrumentalism works if and only if science is seen as a discipline entirely inspired by practical concerns, solving problems. But it goes wrong when it emphasizes that practicality is achieved to the exclusion of truth. Right? You don't have to get rid of this searching after scientific truth in order to say that science is going to achieve cool practical results. Cure diseases, catch the mice, whatever it is. Right? So the fact that the non-realist instrumentalists set themselves up as being a completely different approach to it, in fact, the thing that they're touting, the achieving of practical results, is not exclusive to that. It also can happen in other kinds of science, scientific approaches as well. Okay? Carol? In, in the real world, do people really divide themselves out this way? Because it seems like a lot of people think that science can either be applied kind of practical, pragmatic stuff, or it could also be that more airy-fairy, you know, yeah. really, I can't think of the word, what is the word for Theoretical. research, no, the research that is basic, like like relativity or something like that, that doesn't have, that you can't see what the, what the okay. application is going to ever be. Okay. Remember Proxmire mm -hmm. and his whatever award to the, the stupidest things that the government ever funded for yeah. research. And and that was usually it was this the stuff that didn't you couldn't see the practical application right right now. But it, it was a going after truth. There are a couple of different kinds of science that people can say, yeah, they're both science. Well, it, yes, but you, the, the first question you ask is, do people really divide them up themselves, themselves up this way? as realists versus non realists The majority of scientists, well, all uh, philosophers of science do. Mm -hmm. These are the two big categories. And so if you're doing philosophy of science, you have to decide what direction you're going in, and these sort of go in the opposite directions. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that scientists divide themselves up. They call themselves practical scientists or theoretical scientists. Mm -hmm. You know, you've watched Big Bang Theory. Mm -hmm. um, Sheldon is a theoretical ph physicist on Big Bang Theory. And he thinks that, that um, uh, the engineer. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, his roommate. Oh, Leonard. Leonard. That Leonard is a lesser scientist because he's dealing in practical applications of science, laser and stuff. So the theoretical scientists think they're the real scientists, and the practical scientists say, well, you, you can sit around and think all you want to all day. You're not helping anybody. <laughs> and so they do divide themselves up that way. I mean, not necessarily strictly you know, realist, non-realist. But yes, there are distinct disciplinary approaches, theoretical and practical sciences being an example of that. And you can be either a theoretical physicist or a practical physicist. And of course, they both they both make fun of their friend Howard, who is an engineer. I mean, he's the ultimate pragmat pragmatist. You know, he invented the toilet on the space station, you know, <laughs> and then went up there to install it. <laughs> and they, they, you know, he only has a master's degree, so he's like the scum of the earth <laughs> in terms of <laughs> academics, all right? And so, yes, scientists do make very clear de delineations between these kinds of things. 
In terms of realist, non-realist, that's much more what a philosopher of science would decide there in one direction. Okay? It just seems like there's value in both. Oh yeah, and, and, and <laughs> I, I think I think that anybody sensible would say there's value. You need you need theoretical physicists. You need practical yeah. physicists. You, but again, a a uh, instrumentalist would say the search for truth in any theoretical sense is a silly waste of time. Whereas John Polkinghorne, who was a quantum physicist, very practical kind of stuff in many ways, talks about the search for science's search for a particular kind of truth. And so yeah, it doesn't have to be one or the other, but people do tend to divide themselves up that way. Hmm. Okay. Can I what would oh, Einstein sure. be? What? What would Einstein be? Absolutely a theoretical physicist. Yeah. Right. Einstein came up with all of these theories, the theory of special relativity theory, uh, you know, and, and others, um, and couldn't prove them. There was no practical application. His mathematics, and this is one of the things that I am astonished by and still don't really understand how, how principles in the physical world that are unknown can be argued for and even proven by mathematics. See, Einstein is a mathematician. I mean, he was a mathematical physicist. His mathematical arguments for the nature of relativity, like the fact when we say relativity, one of the things that's relative is that light bends in gravity, and that time is not a constant. When it travels at a, you know, near the speed of light, it changes. The density changes, all that. He came up with, with mathematical arguments for all of those physical things and it was many, many years before any of them were proven. They talk about in the book the fact they couldn't really prove his theory that light bends from gravity until they had an eclipse. And they were able to measure the light as it came around the, from the sun, as it came around the moon, and determine that truly, surely enough, he was right that light bends. He couldn't physically prove any of that stuff. It was all theoretical. All right? So. Now, both realists and instrumentalists, remembering that instru in instrumentalists are the largest category of non-realist scientists, affirm that science is ultimately a rational discipline properly based on evidence and objective reasoning. But a lot of modern, most recent philosophers, like all this bunch of folks that died in the 90s, <laughs> don't agree with that. They don't agree necessarily that science is a rational discipline. And again, you get into questions of definition. What is rationality with regard to a discipline like science? The book talks quite a bit about Thomas Kuhn. It's not Q, I don't think, because there's no E on the end. That's right. It's Kuhn, who lived from 1922 to 1996. He argued that in actual practice, based upon his own discipline pursuits, that science as a discipline is far from being rational in any objective sense of what the word rational means. Science, not rational? Now don't make funny faces until you hear the arguments, okay? Where's it coming from? First, he, consistent with some of the objections against inductionism, identified that scientific observation of the world is theory-laden, meaning all observations are processed through and influenced by prior scientific or personal paradigms so neutral observation is impossible. At the break, John and I were talking about this idea that you can't observe something without actually changing it. Well, there are two ways that that can happen. One way is, and I use the sociological example or anthropological example, that by trying to observe a primitive tribe, you cause them to react to your observation in such a way that changes them. That means you have actually had a real and concrete practical effect in making a change in what you're observing, for example. Same thing is true in Heisenberg's principle. You know, if you try to nail down the exact location of a quantum particle, you change it, right? So that's one way. But the other way that we have to say that you change something by observing it is the thing itself might not be changed, but by the process of observing it, you are bringing it into your whole series of presumptions and past experiences and expectations and paradigms that you have previously bought into, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So even if the thing itself that you're observing is not changed, your observation of it's changed because you bring all of your stuff to the process of observing it. Make sense? And that's what Kuhn was talking about this latest, the second version of that. That whether you practically, concretely change the thing you're observing or not, by bringing that information into your head, 
which is full of all kinds of earlier presumptions and paradigms and expectations and, and prejudices and everything else, that you end up not being able to make a truly neutral observation. Make sense? And you will remember when we talked about you know, what is truth and what is real and is what we observe real, this idea that we're standing, you know, that when we look at the world, it's like we're looking through a pane of glass and what we're seeing is just simply the image coming through the glass. No. Light reflecting off the thing, which then comes through our corneas and hits our retina and, you know, affects the rods and cones and that sends electrical signals that go through our optic nerve into our brain and our brain interprets all that in terms of color and texture and distance and all that kind of stuff. I mean, there's a thousand things that happens to that stuff before it actually gets interpreted as anything considered a sense observation. Well, are there not other stuff in my head that causes me to also interpret that? I use the example of the TV show Perception. This guy who is a brilliant brain scientist solves cases for the FBI, but it's a paranoid schizophrenic. And so he always has to question, is what I'm seeing real or is this hallucination? That's a, that's a real effect too, like how we approach scripture. I mean, right. there's, I don't know if, there, if it's really real, a tabla blanca, where you have just a rasa. blank mind mm -hmm. uh, to approach something. It's, it, that, that really exists when you're, when you're dealing with that as well. And you, the reason so many people really screw up interpretations of scripture is because they come to it usually with their social expectations. Okay? Um, this is what my particular social milieu has decided is right, wrong, good, bad, best, whatever, and so therefore I'm going to interpret these scriptures based upon that. You do it. You do it too. Ma'am. Well, the other thing is when you have a crime and you have 10 people that observed it, every single person yeah. cannot describe right. one thing perfect. He had brown eyes, he was wearing a hat, he had a beard. I mean, he was tall, he was thin, he was short, he was fat. Everybody saw something different. Right. And the other thing is when you're using your eye theory about seeing something and bouncing right. the retina. If you're colorblind, mm -hmm. that's a very small Absolutely. point, but it's a very huge point. Right. Where do disabilities come into that? Where, right. Yeah. right. Yeah, I've mentioned that show several times, Perception, but they've had several shows in the series during the third season where they've dealt with things like the people become so focused on something that they don't see something else that's happening right in their line of sight. Have you all seen the gorilla playing basketball thing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. It's a real test. If you haven't seen it, it's very cool. They took people, and they, there are two teams passing and dribbling a basketball, you know, and they say, count how many times the ball gets dribbled. And they're dribbling and passing and dribbling and passing, and people are paying attention. Right in the middle of this thing, this gorilla, a guy in a gorilla suit, wearing a basketball uniform, walks through the scene. Just in one side and out the other. And at the end, they ask the people, so, how many times did the basketball get dribbled? And they said, oh, 27, 94, whatever. Anything else that you noticed that seemed unusual about this? No. <laughs> The vast majority of people did not see, and he doesn't run through, he just slowly walks through the scene, very obviously. A guy in a gorilla suit wearing a basketball suit. <laughs> they actually have to show that again. Because they, then they show it to people again, and they're like, holy crap, how did I, what's, what is, what's that? The idea that sometimes our very expectations, they were told, count the number of dribbles, and they were so focused on that, they missed the gorilla in the basketball. <laughs> Those kind of tests are exactly what verifies, and, and that's been done over and over and over again, with quite uniform results. Very rarely does anybody see the gorilla. Okay. Um, so that's one thing, is Kuhn argued that observation is always theory-laden. It is never truly neutral or objective. Secondly, scientific progress, Kuhn said, occurs not as the, you know, realists say, the inductionists and others, that scientific progress does not occur by the accumulation of data. You know, remember, you accumulate data, you make observations, you get more to data, you observations, experiments, etc. He says that scientific progress occurs by a much more abrupt process, which is paradigm shifts. He argues that all scientists have 
paradigms, that is models on which they are interpreting their data or by which they're interpreting their data. And that only when those models get changed, a new model comes along, do we have progress in science. He says when data emerges that simply cannot be made to fit in the reigning paradigm, can't be resolved in any way within that paradigm, that that's when we have what he called a scientific revolution occurs. In other words, in the vast majority of cases, I have my own paradigm if I'm a scientist, and I take data and I interpret it in light of that paradigm. There may be an occurrence where something causes me to change my paradigm. At some point, people decided that the, the approach to astrophysics before Copernicus wasn't right anymore, and they agreed that Copernicus and Galileo had been right. Okay. At some point, they made that change. But that change was so abrupt, it changed everything if you're an astrophysicist. Nothing fit anymore. That constituted the scientific revolution. Same thing with Einstein. When Einstein came up with the theory of relativity, which the bottom line is, Einstein's theories of re relativity said that Newton was wrong. Newton had been everything before that. Well, they, people wouldn't accept it for a long time. Some people saw that it seemed to be true and advocated for it, but the majority of scientists said, no way, you can't throw Isaac Newton out. You know, well, eventually they proved that he was right and there was a scientific revolution. And so progress is not this observe, 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 test, get more data, observe, 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 draw, Propose a hypothesis, test it, draw a conclusion. Ah, no. It comes with changing of paradigms, and then when those paradigm changes are big enough, scientific revolution. That's what Kuhn said. And so therefore, that's not so much a rational process as it is a revolutionary process. You don't reason your way from one to the other. You get smacked in the face with it, and you have to deal with it. Okay? And then thirdly, Kuhn said that each paradigm contains its own standard of rationality. Let me explain that first. He was saying you cannot evaluate one paradigm based upon the rules or standards or criteria of another paradigm. Why is it that the people in authority during the time of Galileo who believed that the Earth was the center of the universe, they couldn't even talk about this in a reasonable way with Galileo? Galileo. Instead, they called him a heretic and locked him up in his house. Because they were coming from a paradigm the rules of which were so completely incompatible with Copernican um, idea of astronomy, which Galileo was presenting, they couldn't even talk with each other about it. And it wasn't until many years later when there was such a weight of evidence they got smacked in the face with it, they had to change the paradigm. And, and it was a revolution, it was a big enough deal. So each paradigm within itself contains its own standard of rationality that does not apply to any other paradigm, Again, a paradigm is a model by which you interpret what you observe. So there can be no real debate across paradigm boundaries, and that's the reason, Kuhn says, science is not a rational enterprise. If you can't talk with each other about your differences, then you're not having a right, it's not a rational approach. And yet he says that bottom line, unless, unless the evidence is so overwhelming, you have to change your paradigm, or more overwhelming even than that, that you've experienced such a, a radical change, it's a revolution, a scientific revolution. Until that happens, one paradigm holder and another paradigm holder keep, don't even talk the same language. They can't even communicate with regard to their understanding. And for that reason, he says, science is not rational. Now, there are several objections. Now, almost everybody looks at what Kuhn said and said, you got some good points there, buddy. Okay. But there are some objections. And that is, and the objections are primarily when you draw this out to the logical conclusions. For instance, one thing is if you if you take this in itself, people people are quick to say, people in this business are quick to say, that this doesn't fit the common sense understanding of what the scientific process is all about. Okay? That, that if it's not a rational experience, science is not a rational uh, enterprise that is cumulative, that it's getting better, you know, that we're getting, you know, our science is getting better as we learn more and learn more and learn more. If we don't have some sense of that, which is kind of the common sense view, then we don't have any science at all. Let's all go home and get drunk, all right? 
So there is a common sense kind of response to this to say that, okay, if you don't believe that science is a rational enterprise that is progressively learning more and more, then something is, something, there's a disconnect here. Secondly, they said that if you draw Kuhn's conclusions out to their logical end, that it allows no objective critique or defense of any theory. If every paradigm has its own set of rules and those paradigms can't talk to each other, then unless you have exactly the same paradigm as I, then we can't even talk about it, which means if you have a different paradigm, I can't critique that. I can't suggest improvements. I can't make observations about that. We live in different universes with regard to our paradigms. Well, there's a problem with that. Okay, in terms of any practicality, because we know we know that scientists do critique each other's paradigms. Now, they may not always agree with somebody else's critique of their paradigm, but it happens, and people do change their paradigms because of that. Third, this gives no real explanation. Kuhn gave no real explanation for how or even why scientific revolutions occur. All he could say is that at a certain point, if the paradigm shift is so great, you know, everything changes. Well, how is that, and why is that, and what's the criteria for that? He didn't explain any of that in his theory. And then, it's been argued that to some extent, Kuhn's um, arguments are self-defeating, because he claims no truth claims can be regarded as objectively true in science, and if that's true, then how do we, object, what, how do we accept his claims about science as being objectively true? Would you read that again? Okay. Um, if no truth claims, which is, and this is, Kuhn says that it's not rational as a process. If no truth claims can be regarded as objectively true, that is, everything's subjective. I mean, this, this, Kuhn's argument is that everything is subjective. That's why it's not, you can't talk to each other about it. If no truth claims in science can be regarded as objectively true, then why does he ask us to accept his truth claims as being objectively true? There's the self defeater. Whenever you hear absolute statements about things, you should always ask the question, given that absolute statement, if I apply that back to that absolute statement, is it allowable or is, that it's, uh, is it self-defeating? That happens a lot. You've noticed from our talks how all, often... All generalizations are false. All generalizations are false. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're welcome. Okay. Pam. Can you imagine being in the era that you suddenly find out that the earth is not flat? Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean... Some people still don't buy that. <laughs> it's There's a flat earth society. <laughs> yeah, what? There's a flat earth society. Flat earth oh, society. Really? Didn't know that one. Some of it's tongue in cheek, but I think there are few, few people that still believe it. Carolyn? Oh, I, to me, again, this seems like everybody's trying to make there are two kinds of people in the world. You know, it's all black or white. People who believe there are two kinds of people in the world, people who don't. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. Well, again, this is the process of philosophy. Because Part of philosophy is an issue of defining things, which means you have to sort of dice them up. But can't you, you can see, you know, you said that you can see that that's kind of true, that there are just closed minded people. I, most of us are. Yeah. <laughs> we, have our, we have our own comfort beliefs, and, and it would be, you know, it would be revolutionary to change our mind about our pet theories. Right. And but obviously that there are other people who are a little more open-minded and and can communicate between par paradigms. And right. And part of the issue is what compromises or what what modifications or what changes are we prepared to accept in mm -hmm. our beliefs mm -hmm. of any kind. Exactly. Whether we're talking theological beliefs, philosophical beliefs, exactly. you know, beliefs about you know, the, the quality of somebody's cooking. How, what are we willing to accept and then what are we not? Mm -hmm. And what are we willing to die for? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we do need to understand that there are differences that occur. And, and some of these folks, like uh, Kuhn, and we're about to talk about a guy um, Faye Robin, who, I mean, they planted their flag and said, this is absolutely true. You know, and anybody who doesn't believe it's kind of dumb. <laughs> well, we don't go there. But in order for us to clear, one of the processes, in order for us to be clear on what it is we think and believe, the best way to sharpen that is by considering what other people think and believe. Right. Not so you can buy into it, but so that you can understand why you don't buy into it. Mm -hmm. Okay? John? 
this is probably a dumb question, but according to Thomas Kuhn, can can one um, um, modify his um, paradigm, or does he must he must he blow it up? Must he jump <laughs> and blow up and go and go and, and form a completely different paradigm? No, you can you can modify. For instance, here scientific observation of the world theory, meaning all observations are processed through and influenced by prior scientific and personal paradigms. In other words, I may add to my paradigm, I may interpret according to my paradigm, new data. So my, my, I may be well, adding can, data can, within can my paradigm. It can change. Yes. Well, can change within a certain point. Modify. If it changes too Modify. much, uh -huh. then it becomes a new paradigm. New paradigm. What can happen? And if the change in paradigms, I mean, if I've got, and people don't often have one paradigm. They may have one dominant paradigm, like Christian worldview, for instance. But if too many of your paradigms get erupted at once, that's what leads to a scientific revolution, True. apparently, although he didn't, you know, he didn't detail that, and that's one of the complaints against him. He had some, some good things to say, and we need to pay attention to that. You know, this idea of scientific observation being theory-laden is accurate. Um, some of his understanding about paradigm shifts are true, although I don't agree, and a lot of people don't agree with the idea that people who have different paradigms can't communicate about those things. The only reason they can't, the only time they couldn't communicate about them is if they are so rapidly egotistical that they're unable to even consider that there may be some other aspect of, of knowledge or understanding out there that they need to hear. And there are people like that. Okay? Um, all right, let's go on. Another, another approach to scientific non realism, which is the extreme end of the spectrum, is scientific anarchism, which is what it sounds like. The most skeptical approach. Uh, scientific anarchism says that science is not constrained by any, any methodological rules, so anything goes. Science is whatever you want to do. No rules, no controls, nobody has a right to tell you what to do. Now, it's interesting, um, Feyerabend, who they talk about in the book, his real shtick is human freedom and self-determination. I mean, that's his real issue. And he has gone back and he has inserted that into a philosophy of science in terms of how science is done. So let's talk about that. Um, he again lived from the 20s until the mid 90s. There must be somebody taking these guys out. I don't know. Um, but he himself identified his approach as scientific anarchism because he believes in no rules. Sounds like a cartoon villain. Oh, you're right. In. He does, yeah. No, I meant the, the scientific anarchism. Oh, yeah, essay. Um, so, like Kuhn, Feyerabend agreed that each paradigm has its own rationality, its own set of rules, its own criteria, etc. So, anarchism sees no way to compare or assess scientific theories objectively. The two, can't, two different paradigms can't talk to each other. And so, therefore, you can't assess others. You can't compare them. Everything, therefore, becomes ultimately subjective. This is the sort of the bottom line point of scientific anarchism. Science is what I decide it is. Accuracy in science is what I believe it is. It is impossible to show that one scientific theory offers a better explanation than others. It's even impossible to show that a scientific theory is better than a non-scientific explanation. Feyerabend and other scientific anarchists would say, you don't have a right to say that ghosts aren't real. Or that, you know, Witches and wizards don't know, don't have as much right to claim their truth as theologians and philosophers do. Okay? You can't prove that because one paradigm, the witch's paradigm, has a completely set of different set of standards and rules and expectations, and that doesn't speak to the Christian theist paradigm, nor the other way. I'm not saying I agree with them. Don't ever make the mistake of saying when I tell you about this stuff that I'm agreeing with this. As I just said, this leads to near complete subjectivity in science. And he actually said, what remains after all of this consideration are our subjective wishes. And that those wishes constitute a mythology that cannot be shown to be better than non-scientific mythologies. Now, again, Feyerabend's, and he's the one who created this, there are others, not a lot, but there are some others who maintain this, he was absolutely in favor, as his main point, of self-determination. You're not the boss of me. I 
as a scientist, will pursue my own investigations under my own metho methodology. You can't dictate rules to me. He believed that science had inappropriately become the standard for all knowledge. And it's almost as though when he talks about witches and warlocks having just as much right to claim their knowledge as you, know, as you scientists, it's almost as though he's, he's stating hyperbolically his belief that there's other kinds of knowledge in the world than just scientific knowledge. And he believed that science had simply enforced the status of scientific knowledge coming first to everyone else, particularly through the every level of academia, from kindergarten on. We have made our kids think there's only one way to get knowledge, and that's through science. And, and scientific anarchy is fighting against that. Fayyarabin, who founded this, insists that science is nothing more than an institutionalized ideology that has been forced on people who simply did not have sufficient understanding to be able to repulse it or defend themselves against it, particularly since it starts when they're little kids. How many little kids you know that love the dinosaur books? You know? If it's a dinosaur, okay. How early do we start our kids in science? Well, I'm, I'm speaking from, from, uh, from Fayyarabin's point of view here. He would say that although we have demanded the separation of church and state, we have failed to demand the separation of state and science. And science, therefore, has become a tyrant in terms of excluding all other belief systems. Now, as Christians, we should have a little bit of a sympathy with that. Not maybe the extreme of saying everybody's equally right, it's all subjective, it's just what you want it to be. But at least of saying that science has tried to demand that only science is viable and valid, as opposed to like faith systems. Mm -hmm. Yes? What I wanted to say is today when you go on the internet, you're looking for some viable direction as far as health, um, be it in alternative uh, cancer treatments or what has been deemed by the uh, scientific approach or whatever. Um, you, you have these two things that are fighting against each other and which direction to choose when you have an illness and how to do that. Right. And so to me, it's, it's as though one establishment is trying to prove that they're correct over another alternative. Right. right. Now that's not, that's true. And there are very illegitimate ways of saying, uh, of different ideologies doing that, science over holistic medicines, etc. But let's not make the mistake of believing that some things are not more true than others, because they are. Mm -hmm. right? And I'm, I'm, I'm saying that without specific examples other than to say the Christian faith is an example that I would argue that belief in Christian theism is a more viable truth than alternatives. Okay, so I'm there too, to a certain extent. All right? Now, we're running out of time, so I need to keep moving forward. Yeah, well, I just, would you spell the man's name who founded that? Well, it's in the book. It's F-E-Y-E-R-A-B-E-N-D, Fyarabend. He said, this is a quote, Science reigns supreme because its practitioners are unable to understand and unwilling to condone different ideologies because they have the power to enforce their wishes. That sums up where he's coming from. And there's some truth in what he's saying. Some truth. Okay, I wouldn't advocate anarchism in science because of that, but I would say that as a Christian, looking at the attitude that much of the academic world and the scientific world has toward faith-based beliefs, there's something there, okay? Now, nature and its limits. Realism is an approach to science we've talked about that struggles because of a necessary reliance on inductive reasoning. Remember from David Dumont, people have claimed that the causality of inductive reasoning can't be, can't be rationally argued. Non-realistic views, on the other hand, cannot account for the practical success of science. Okay, non-realistic, if they don't have something to do with the truth, then how are they getting such good results? There's got to be something there. Given the wondrous things that science has accomplished, it is hard to account for these things without believing that science more or less describes or corresponds to the physical world and in that way that it does represent truth. Okay, fair? Science would not be as successful it is, as it is if it didn't in some way reflect some truth about the natural world. And that, rep that argues for realism rather than non-realism. Because non-realism says truth isn't, isn't an issue at all. 
you know, and asking for it is wrong. However, science is also about other things than the search for truth, and it serves other functions. And that, that like the pragmatic sense of, you know, coming up with great cool stuff that works well and cures people from diseases and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so to that extent, non-realism that focuses on those pragmatic, practical application kinds of stuff does have something for its argument as well. Although we have to remember, not, realism does not negate the value of the practical, pragmatic stuff. It simply says truth is also part of it. Okay. It would appear, this is what the book says, and I've got it up here because I agree with it, that the best approach in the philosophy of science is a humble realist or realism view of science that acknowledges that science does offer some truth values, like Polkinghorne said, it's just a different kind of truth than theology, even though typically science serves other functions as the primary, and that scientists like the rest of us are fallen and so have a limited awareness of truth. Okay? Science does search for and identify certain kinds of truth. At its primary purpose, however, is the practical solving of empirical problems. That's what science does best and what we recognize most. And when they start trying to say more than that, like you people are stupid if you believe in something that's not in the material world, then we need to remember you guys are just as broken as anybody. You know, you don't have a singular claim to authority because you're smarter, better, you know, more experienced than the rest of us. We are all fallen. Okay. I've got a few more slides here. I want to talk about the laws of nature for a minute because this comes in, this is a special case within the philosophy of um, science because the laws of nature, things like gravity, nuclear forces, you know, the, nuclear, the uh, positive and negative uh, nuclear forces, or I'm sorry, strong and weak nuclear forces, I mean, the conservation of matter and energy, thermodynamics, aerodynamics, etc. Those are laws of nature that are constant phenomena. Gravity does not change ever. If it did, we'd be in trouble. The fact that those are constant phenomena, how are we to understand their relationship to the scientific endeavor? Okay. There are three views to this that parallel what we talked about before. And the reason I'm doing this is because the laws of nature constitute a special case. They're not empirically verifiable. I mean, we can say, we can observe them in action, but we cannot empirically give any explanation. We don't know why gravity works, we just know it does. We don't know why the laws of thermodynamics are true, we just observe that they are true. So we have no explanation for them. Our, our empirical um, consideration of them can only be observational to the point of seeing what is happening, not why it's happening. The first view, the regularity view, says that natural laws are a summary of what has happened and what will continue to happen. So it defies the problem of induction. It defies the limitation of causality. That how nature works with the question of why the natural laws work as they do um, is seen as illegitimate or meaningless. I'm sorry, let's say that again. The point of the regularity view is this is how nature works. This is how it is. This is how it really is. This is the regular stuff, in other words. And the question of why they work like that doesn't mean anything. It just is. The second view, which you'll recognize, instrumentalist view as a name, takes the pragmatic approach that apparent, apparent universality of natural laws is not what's important. It doesn't matter that they're universal, always constant, etc., etc. What matters is that because they're there, we can take them and use them for other stuff. That pragmatism. We base our scientific efforts on those laws. The discussion of what they are, why they are, whatever, is meaningless. Let's just use them. There's that pragmatism. Now, the regularity view is, the, is an application to the laws of nature of realism. This is, this is the real description of the way the world is. The instrumentalist view is, as you would imagine, the non-realist, instrumentalist, pragmatist kind of approach. A third view is the necessi necessitarian view, which suggests that the laws of nature are just how the world, are, are not just how the world behaves, it is how it must behave. That there is a logical necessity for the laws of nature to exist. That they are, according to the necess necessitarian view, the laws of nature are universal truths, 
and therefore it is not possible for there to be exceptions to them, and therefore they are logically necessary. Well, there's a problem with that from our point of view, because if the laws of nature are logically necessary, then that means there is no cause outside them, that they are inherent of themselves, and so they are seen as anti-supernatural. Okay, the, the laws of nature are logically necessary in and of themselves. There is no cause for them. There is nothing beyond them or greater than them. Therefore, that's not compatible with theism. Of these three, the necessitarian view <laughs> is the one that is completely incompatible with Christian theism or any kind of theism. Because it, by claiming the natural laws are an absolute truth, a logical necessity, it denies the existence of anything greater than that. So, um, there's a problem, a couple of problems with the necessitarian view. One is if they are logically necessary, which the necessitarian view claims, then the natural laws could be discoverable by thought alone. Logically necessary means that we can conceive of them by rationality alone, and yet we don't experience the laws of nature other than by empirically observing their, their action. We don't understand the law of gravity by sitting in a dark room and conceiving of it. We see it in action. You remember how Isaac Newton came up with the theory of gravity? An apple fell on his head. That's about as empirical as you get. Now, whether that really happened or not, I don't know. But, um, so, there are problems with it. But you need to understand that when dealing with the laws of nature, they're kind of a special case. And there is a special argument that we can make from them. First, the laws of nature, as constants, are necessary for life to exist. Without gravity, thermodynamics, and the other laws of nature, human life, or any kind of life, would not be possible. And they have to be, the fine-tuning argument, they have to be exactly what they are. If gravity were only slightly greater or slightly less, we couldn't survive. Secondly, since the natural laws are necessary for human survival, and this, by the way, is a logical argument I'm making here. But you'll see what I'm getting to in the premise. Since natural laws are necessary for human survival, they may be seen as evidence of the existence of a purposeful, intelligent, powerful, and benevolent mind at work behind the scenes. This is consistent with the Caleb argument we made, which is a cosmological argument. It's also consistent with the fine-tuning argument, which is a version of the teleological argument. That all of these pieces of the natural laws fit together in just exactly the way, contrary to all probability, to make life possible is an evidence, not a proof, but an evidence of God. That's the fine-tuning argument. If natural laws, then, are the product of a benevolent God, we can be sure that they will continue, meaning that the future will be consistent with the past. The inductive problem is not real. Causality is dependable. Hume was wrong. Okay? And finally, given the dependence of science on the assumption of natural laws as constants, no matter how secular, no matter how anti-God a scientist is, he accepts the natural laws as being constants. Otherwise, he couldn't be a scientist. He couldn't be much of anything. The dependence of science on the assumption of natural laws as constants, it can be seen that rational scientific investigation inherently presupposes a reliance upon God, who made and sustains those constants, and that all scientific inquiry therefore implicitly demonstrates this faith. The only question is not whether scientists exhibit faith, but what kind of faith is being exhibited. This is a logical argument, and I will be right up front and say the point that most secularists or materialists would argue is premise number two. Whether or not the natural laws that are necessary for human survival, they wouldn't argue with that part, whether they are evidence of a benevolent God. The fine-tuning argument and the Caleb argument of cosmology both would say that they are and would give logical explanations for what they are. The point in this is everybody has faith. The only issue is what kind of faith do you have? The most secular scientist in the world has faith in the constants of the natural laws, or he could not be a scientist or much of anything else. If you do not believe when you wake up in the morning that gravity is going to be consistent, and that the laws of thermodynamics are going to be there, which involves the transfer of heat, if you did not believe in the conservation of energy and matter, then the, then the sun is going to go out pretty quick, etc., etc. And so they all, we all have faith that those things are going to be sustained, or we wouldn't survive another minute. 
Dallas Willard says faith is not restricted to religious people. Okay. Um, oh, I've got more stuff. And it's really good stuff, too. I'm going to pick this up next week when we start. We're going to talk about um, naturalism being the idea that the only things that are valid are things in the natural world as a version of materialism. Um, and, and that compared to theistic science. I will pick that up starting next week before we get into ethics. Any questions about any of that? Are we good? You understand this stuff? Oh, Pam? Uh, yeah. uh, which one of them again explains or gives an out for supernatural? Um, well, scientific realism does not preclude it. That's the best I can say about that. Okay. Most Christians would identify themselves as scientific realists and probably inductionists um, of, of some kind, that they induce reality from the world because they believe in causality, and they believe causality is part of the natural law that God created. Okay? Okay. Um, I mean, there are other than, like in the views we were just looking at, other than necessitarian, necessitarian, <laughs> A Christian could, should take a, could take a regularity view or an instrumentalist view. I mean, and, and they could say that either, you know, uh, science identifies truths in nature because God put those truths there. And it's one kind of truth. All truths are God's truth. It's one kind of truth as opposed to a theological truth. Or they could say from an in, uh, instrumentalist point of view that um, God created science in a way that it is consistent and we can use it to do really cool stuff. And that the really cool stuff is the goal of science, but it's that's because God made the world the way he did and science works that way. So neither one of those are inherently inconsistent with the theological view. The necessitarian, because it sees the, the natural laws as being a absolute ultimate authority, above which there is nothing else, and a logical necessity, therefore, they, they deny the truth of God. Thanks, guys.